wherever you're at on the spiritual spectrum, if you're here tonight and you're sitting there saying there is no God, or you're here tonight saying I have known Jesus Christ for a long time, wherever you are at, my hope for you is that you would see Jesus either for the first time or you would see him in a fresh way. Maybe your heart has grown cold to the Lord and what you need is just a fresh glimpse of who he is. I hope that you experience that tonight because here at the porch, we believe God is here and he wants to meet with us. And so my hope for you is as we're about to open up the word of God, my hope is that you would believe that God wants to say something to you tonight. We're continuing a series that we started two weeks ago. We got iced out last week. We missed you guys last week. But two weeks ago, we started a series that we're calling The Return, Living Like Jesus is Coming Back. And so here's the thought of the series, just to catch you up. The thought is this, if those doors right back there were to open up and Jesus Christ were to walk into the room and we were to hand him a microphone and he were to say, hey, I just want to tell all the 20 and 30 somethings in Dallas tonight at the porch, mark your calendars one year from today, I am coming back. Like if we had that type of information, if we knew that Jesus was coming back in a year, what would change? Like, what would we start doing? What would we stop doing? Would things shift? And I think that they would. And so each week of this series, we're just talking about something that we might start doing or something we might stop doing. Two weeks ago, we started a countdown clock, just the thought of hypothetically, one year from today. And so as my friend, the other teaching pastor here at Watermark, John Elmore, comes up in just a couple minutes to speak. You're going to see that countdown clock come up. And it's just a reminder that what would it look like for us to live with a sense of urgency that our days are numbered? You are going to get to hear from my good friend, John Elmore. He's just one of the, the greatest pastors and teachers that I know. I'm so glad for you to get to hear from him tonight. So as he comes up, I hope that you just lean in to what he's going to say because I think God wants to do a good work tonight in our hearts. Before we do that though, just wanna take a moment and get to know the people around us. There are interesting and unique people sitting all around you. And so I just wanna encourage you, take a moment, stand up, turn around, shake a hand, say hello, introduce yourself, and then we'll be back. Welcome Porch Live. So, man, I wish somebody would have punked me and said I was going to happy hour and brought me here. Because when I was your age, I lost my 20s, like 20s, like a decade plus, because I wasn't here. And so maybe tonight, something will be said that will keep you from losing your 20s, your 30s as well. There's some Porch Live locations listening in. There's many, but the ones that you're gonna hear from tonight that we're gonna say hello to is Porch Live down in Austin which is crazy because, dude, that's where I almost died. More on that later. Boise, never been, I'm sure you're good people. Midland and Scottsdale, welcome to y'all and everywhere else. So when you walked in, what'd you get? Everybody got a penny. Yeah, we went big on you guys tonight, right? Prosperity gospel or something. Hey, so, no, it's bogus. There's a mark of authenticity on the penny. Like, check it out. Like, look down. Nobody notices a penny. Like, you walk past a penny, you don't even pick it up anymore. It's worth next to nothing. But, but right there beside the year, there's a letter. And that letter shows that it's not counterfeit. It's not a fake. Like, it, it, in fact, if yours doesn't have a letter, like, our bad. But it should have, like, a D or a CC or a P. And it stands for Denver or Carson City or Philadelphia. It's the U.S. Mint where your coin was made. It's to show that it is real and not fake. And uh, as I was thinking about this tonight, 
I was like, you know what? They probably deserve to know that I'm, I'm gonna get real with them and not be fake. And so if you flipped me over, you'd see right about here, a, a tattoo. Anybody got a tattoo that they're like, man, I wish I did not have this tattoo. Anybody, show of hands? I see you there. Okay, all right. So I got my own little tramp stamp here on the right back side. And uh, I guarantee you, I'm gonna make you feel better about your bad tattoo. I was wasted in Austin, Texas, drunk out of my mind, walk into a tattoo parlor and the girl that I was with, that wasn't her name at the time, but I called her Kitten. And so I was like, well, well, what better thing to get tattooed forever on my body than her nickname? So I have the word Kitten still right here. And I am married, and I'm married, all right. And I'm married, and I'm married to a girl and her nickname is not Kitten, and it's still there. But if you're gonna go, go big. And so I was like, you know what? Put a cat paw beside it. So it says Kitten in kindergarten writing with a little cat paw beside it. Dude, I used to do prison ministry and I would tell them that and the guys were like, dude, you can't say that in here. I was like, why? They're like, never repeat that. It's a mark of authenticity. It's not the only bad mistake I made. I made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake from 18 to 30 because I'm, I was an alcoholic. I didn't know, I didn't think I was because I didn't keep a fifth of vodka in my desk drawer. I wasn't sleeping in the ditch. And so I was like, dude, I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm working for an ad agency down in Austin, like getting written up and clients like Dell and 3M and DuPont. I'm like, doing okay. Like I'm not an alcoholic. I just like have to I have fun. I work hard, I play hard. Like that's it. And so on Saturday morning after a long Friday night and then a Friday morning, Saturday morning, I'd wake up and I'd put scotch in a coffee mug. Now it had to be a black coffee mug because otherwise people would see that I was drinking scotch in the morning to keep the hangover at bay and to keep the buzz going. And so I'm like, you know, idiot, like drink all night, coffee mug of scotch. And then there was one New Year's, like you thought kitten was a bad decision. One New Year's Eve, like terrible New Year's Eve plans. I, I go in again, I've got a glass of scotch, walk into a car dealership. I'm like, what's up? I'm here to buy a car and bought a car. And the next morning I wake up and I'm, I look out in the driveway. I'm like, oh man, I bought a car and it's an Isuzu. It was even worse. They don't even make those cars anymore. They were so bad. And here I am left with that thing. And then I was in Manhattan once. We took like a guy's trip, me and all my college buddies. We go out, Broadway, wasted, some party. Next morning, we're at breakfast. I'm drinking because I don't want to feel what I'm feeling from the night before. And I want to keep things going like we're here to party. And a buddy leans over, one of my drinking friends. And he's like, hey man, have you ever considered that you might have a drinking problem? And I'm like, what? You bought a round last night, like you were there. Why are you coming at me like that? Have you ever considered that you might have a shut your mouth problem? Like why, why are you, why, why? Like we're partying, what are you talking about? And then I had two doctors tell me, hey, if you keep drinking like this, you're going to die. But at this point in my life, I was okay with that because the girl and the tattoo, that situation, uh, after I got the tattoo, I showed it to her. And she was like, is that real? I'm like, of course it's real. She's like, why did you get that? I'm like, because we're gonna be together forever. Well, she was already sleeping with one of my buddies. That's how I felt. <laughs> Little worse. I loaded my 12 gauge shotgun and I called my friend about a hundred times in a row. He lied and said he was in Canada, which was good for both of us. Because I was like, hey man, you're dead. Like I'm, I'm killing you and then I'm gonna kill myself because I don't wanna spend life in prison. Like that's it, like murder, suicide. I have, I have nothing left to live for. Like, like the cars, the money, the house, the lake property, like it's just, it is a house of cards. You pulled this one out, poof, it's like, what am I, I'm not, I have nothing else to live for. Like I'm not like dog chasing my tail, go and work hard and it can all be lost just like that. No. And so in the midst of not finding my buddy, I took that shotgun, flipped off the safety and put it to my head. And I think in that moment, there, there was a war for my soul. It was the most demonic darkness I have ever felt in my life. And uh, just drank a fifth of vodka, passed out, didn't go through with it. 
And, and at that point, went from functional alcoholism, which is like kind of a joke, it's like, oh, congrats, you can hold a job, you're still a drunk, to, it's okay to laugh, it's laughable, to dysfunctional alcoholism. Now it was like, I was manic, like I was coming undone. Like high highs, low lows, risky behavior, like nothing to lose anymore. Just like walking around draped in an American flag at the US Capitol because I wanted to get shot. I'm like, all right, well, I can't, I can't go through a suicide. It'll hurt my family too much. So maybe I'll just like, I'm just going to trespass and look like an idiot. Somebody's going to shoot me in the middle of the day. No one did. So I grabbed these two homeless guys. It was Wednesday, December 21st, Wednesday morning. I didn't go into work, I'd stopped going into work. I was in sales, I was like, whatever. I'd just like make a call and then go get drunk. At this point, living on a buddy's couch because I didn't want to live with the girl anymore. And uh, I grabbed these two homeless guys at 10 a.m. down in uh, you Austin folks on Congress Avenue. Two homeless guys, I was like, come with me. We go to the Stephen F. Austin Intercontinental Hotel. We're sitting on the deck, getting wasted all day run up a $500 bar tab. I was like, hey, come sit with me. I'll buy you whatever you want. I just don't want to be alone. My brother found out, got a one-way ticket, put me in my own car, drove me to Dallas. I used to hate Dallas. Brought me here. And uh, my family was waiting. And they're like, hey, you're, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting us. No more. Like, you're either going to rehab, but you're not going back. And I'm like, get off my back, like, I'm, are you kidding me? Like, I'm already losing everything and now you're gonna ship me away? Just, what, I'll go to AA, like, okay, all right? Like, I'll go to AA. So I go back to Austin and I'm sitting there and I'm like, am I really an alcoholic? I don't, I mean, I'm probably not. Like, I'm just going through a hard time. Like, I'm probably, <laughs> probably not. Like, isn't that always the case? Like, when you're, when you're right in sin, right after the moment, you're like, dang, that was terrible. I should never do that again. You get a little distance from it and you're like, it wasn't that bad. It's kind of fun. And you get, start getting pulled back to it. And like, man, spoiler alert, if your drinking friends are telling you you drink too much, doctors are telling you you're dying of alcoholism, and your family's doing an intervention, you probably have an alcoholism problem. But I still didn't believe it. So I get online and I Google, how do you know you're an alcoholic? It's like, well, well. And there was this little test, 12 questions. It took me one minute. And for the first time in a long time, I aced the test. <laughs> I was like, oh, shoot, I am. It took me, I mean, it wasn't enough that my friends or doctors or family, it took me admitting, man, I, I have an issue. So two hours later, I walk into an AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous, still not thinking I'm an alcoholic, just like, ah, get my family off my back. And, and at this point in my life, I'm a deist. I'm like, God exists, like somebody made all of this, but he has nothing to do with me. I get the job, I get the girl, I get the money. Like he did, he's not doing anything for me. And frankly, there were two things that stuck with me from my Bible Belt upbringing, two things. And I was like, such, such bogus, like they're lies. I remember hearing there's freedom in Christ. I'm like, there's not freedom in Christ. He keeps me from doing everything I want to do. It's anything but freedom. And I also heard, I remembered, that sin leads to death. I'm like, no, it doesn't. No, nobody, nobody dies because they sleep with their girlfriend. Nobody dies when they look at porn. Nobody dies when they get drunk. That, that's a scare tactic from a youth pastor. Sin doesn't lead to death. And there I am, living on a couch. I've had a gun to my head and doctors tell me I'm dying. I'm like, huh, sin leads to death. It just kind of has a long fuse sometimes. And so I go to this AA meeting and I'm sitting there thinking about all of this. And I'm looking around at these people, I'm judging them. I'm like, what, what losers here at an AA meeting? Not knowing it's like, well, hey, present company, like what got you here? And then they ask, does anyone here want to commit to staying sober for the next 24 hours? And I don't know how to explain it other than I believe the Holy Spirit moved me out of my seat. It's like heart pounding through my chest. And, and like, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you're like, I have to move. I mean, it's just like step up. And so I have to walk forward in front of all these other people. Nobody else goes forward, just me. That would've, it would have been better if there was somebody else, it was just me. 
And uh, the guy's like, will you commit to staying sober for the next 24 hours? And in my mind, I'm like, this is the stupidest thing in the world. Sit around and tell a bunch of war stories about how bad drinking used to be, and then 24 hours, are you serious? I'm dying. I need a little more than 24 hours. But I'm like, whatever, I'm here, yeah, 24 hours, great. Go back to my seat, I'm sitting there, judging everybody, I'm like, I'm so out of here, I'm never coming back to this stupid, worthless meeting again. I get up, and here comes this guy, like biker dude, Bi think Big Lebowski if you've seen it, walks up to me and is like, hey, so you wanna commit to staying sober 24 hours? I'm like, did you hear anything that I just, yeah, that was me, like what are you talking about? He's like, you wanna do it? I'm like, yes. He's like, okay, we'll, we'll take down my number. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, take down my number. I was like, All right, whatever. Okay, what? He's like, I want you to text me tomorrow. Let me know if you stayed sober for 24 hours. Like, what? It's like, what time is it? I'm like, dude, you're so drunk, you don't even know what to, it's, it's six. He's like, okay, set an alarm on your phone, call me at six, let me know if you stayed sober for the next 24 hours. I was like, all right, fine. I go to a Jim's 24 hour cafe in Austin, Texas, stay up all night, because I didn't know what to do. I'm sitting there and, and my phone starts blowing up. Hey, let's go, let's go downtown, let's go to 4th Street, let's go to the pub, let's go whatever, and I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> Because this Charlie guy asked me to stay sober for 24 hours. No, I'm, I'm not. Like, whatever. Call him the next day, 6 o'clock. Hey, Charlie. Hey, did you stay sober? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I stayed sober. He's like, okay, great. You want to go another 24 hours? I'm like, hey, um, man, I know you mean well. Like, I, I appreciate this. I, I've got a real problem. And I need like serious help. My, par my family's thinking about rehab maybe. Like I, I don't, I don't, uh, thank you for your time. But no, I'm, 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 he's like, do you want to go another 24 hours? Will you commit to staying sober for 24 hours? I'm like, okay, okay all right. Uh, fine, Charlie. He's like, great, call me tomorrow at six. Oh, hey, by the way, pray. I'm like, okay. And he did two things there. He's like, he's already, instead of me just alone trying to quit, because I had tried to quit on my own before and it was miserable. It's like, you take a pacifier away from a baby. Like, I'm just, I'm just like, the only solace and peace that I had in alcoholism has now been taken away from me. And so I'm just sc screaming inside because I had no peace. That was my only peace. But he's given me somebody to walk with through this. And then secondly, he was like, well, pray and ask God to help you. Now, a deist at this point in time, but I'm like, whatever, I'll try. He's like, yeah, get on your knees and ask God to help you. So I get on my knees. God, keep me sober today. I don't even know who I'm praying to. Call him the next day. Hey, did you stay sober 24 hours? Yes. By God's strength? I don't know. Did you pray? Yeah, I prayed. Oh, good. Then it was by God's strength. Hey, you want to go another 24 hours? I'm like, hey, Charlie. Hey, really? Uh, hey, man. Um, I've got friends, and thank you. Really appreciate the time. I need, I, need, I, need, I need help. I've got to get sober. He's like, yeah, yeah. Do you want to go another 24 hours? I was like, okay, okay, fine, fine. Call me tomorrow at 6. I will. Remember, pray. Okay, Charlie. <laughs> great, great. Big Lebowski. Yes, right. And so I get on my knees. And then I hit step three in AA, a 12-step program. I thought it was a secret cult. Like, what is this, man? I'm never gonna get out. Like, I don't know what they do here. I'm gone, drink blood, secret handshake. They're gonna take my money. It's not, it's like, step one is you're powerless. Step two, God's all powerful. Well, God, whoever you, you know, A is a little whack. Step three, commit your life and will over to your higher power, whomever you deem him to be. Now in AA, when they say whomever you deem him to be, they mean it, man, they're like, they say, pray to the God of the doorknob. If you can't conceive of a God, pray to the Coke machine. You can pray to the group. It's like, anything goes spirituality. Now I knew from my childhood, I remembered another thing that Jesus saves. And so I go home that night, couch that I'm living on, and I get on my knees, face to the ground. And I'm like, okay, I have squandered everything that you have given me but whatever I have left, it's yours. You get my life, my mind, my body, my relationships, my car, my money, what I do, where I live, it's all yours. 
and I was born again. Like I went from depression and despair, aimlessness, to joy and hope and purpose. My circumstances were still the same, but it's like he moved me into the eye of the hurricane. Everything swirling around and all of a sudden the chaos was, was still. And I was now, it, it's like life had snapped into focus. And I was like, I literally remember thinking, because I've been around enough Christians, I'm like, oh my, this is what they meant by being born again. I was 30 years old. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is it. It's know God and make him known. The rest is details. And what I learned as I bought a Bible and I started tearing it apart, I was like, oh, what I've been doing in AA is what the Lord has been saying all along in his word. It's like all those times that the sociologist and the psychologist ascend the mountain of knowledge only to find the theologians have been sitting there for thousands of years. I was like, yeah, yeah, one day at a time. That's what Jesus said when he said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. He's like, just seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Don't worry about anything else. He's got you. Just seek after him and the rest is details. Like it's all gonna fall into place. He's got you. And then the next verse, it says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. When I was an alcoholic, I couldn't conceive of a life without alcohol. I'm like, what in the world do you do after work? Like, you play board games? Like, what do you do? I, don't, I, have, I didn't have a category. What do you do on Friday? What do you do on Saturday morning? What do you do at the Super Bowl? What do you do at Christmas? What do you do on vacation? What do you do at the wedding reception? I don't know what, what do you do on a date? I, I need that, like I need that. What do you do without alcohol? And God's like, no, 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 no. I'm not asking, I'm not like, Thinking about quitting for the rest of your life is gonna be so overwhelming. I want you to think about today. You walk with me today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. I'm gonna give you daily bread. I'm not gonna give you annual bread or lifetime bread because I'm afraid I might never see you, but once a year or once in your life, I'm gonna give it to you daily. It's gonna be enough and then I'm gonna see you again tomorrow. I'm gonna give you daily bread. I'm gonna see you again tomorrow and I'm gonna give you daily bread. I'm gonna see you again tomorrow and this isn't gonna stop until you're safely at home with me. Daily, just walk with me one day at a time. And I got to Galatians 5.16, like baby believer, and it says there's a command, and it's a very light command with a promise, a profound promise. Paul says, walk by the Spirit. That's it. That's the command. He's like, just walk with me. Walk with me. And the promise, here's the profound promise. He says, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And I found that to be true. This impossible foe that I was facing, this alcoholism that I could not quit on my own, I'm like, all right, then, I'm, then, then every day, it wasn't just at step three, every single day, face to the ground like, God, keep me sober today. I'm gonna walk with you. I'm a really bad Lord of my life. Would you be Lord of my life? Don't just save me from hell. Keep me safe in this life every day, and he upheld his promise. As I walked with him one day at a time, I didn't gratify the desires of the flesh. And uh, you know, I talk a lot about my alcoholism because that was the thing that was killing me, but uh, and I, I, I tell people I never struggled with porn. And the reason why I never struggled with porn is because I loved porn. I'm like, what's the, there's, there's no struggle, thank you. I loved it. <laughs> like, it's free, it's everywhere. I brought it into a relationship that I was in and that fell off. And uh, strip clubs and inappropriate relationships with women fell off and chasing money fell off and my language changed and the music I listened to changed and all of a sudden all the desires of the flesh were just like falling away even though I wasn't even like really focusing on them. I'm just like today, just today with you, I'm gonna walk with you. And what I've found like, like we long for revival, right? Like if Jesus was coming back this year, it's like, Lord, then let there be revival. That at your coming, you would find faith and people loving you and following you and living for you. Like we all long for revival and wanna see the spirit break out. And the greatest, I don't know if I can say greatest, 
one of the greatest revivals that has ever hit this earth happened through a man named Martin Luther who wrote these 95 theses and he nailed them onto a church. And he's like, we've got to change. And you know what the first four were of 95, like bro wrote a laundry list. Like he'd, he'd spent some time thinking about it. 95 things to change. The very first four, which, which screams these are of utmost importance, were all about repentance. He said, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he meant that the whole of Christian life is to be one of repentance. And John Owen, famous Puritan theologian, he said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. He said, do not cease from it. Make it your daily work. And then you got Jonathan Edwards who God used to lead the great awakening here in America. And he wrote his resolutions. He wrote these 70 things. He's like, this is what I will do. This is what I won't do. And he returned to them frequently because he knew he was prone to like drift back away from God and towards his sin. And so you see in all three of these cases with Luther and Owen and Edwards is that the root of revival is repentance. The root of revival is repentance and it doesn't happen in mass. It happens individually. As the spirit like lights us on fire for God that we would hate the sins of the flesh and love the glory of God and individually and then this growing blaze of repentance. Repentance is the root of revival. Because I think that so often in Christianity, like this is the good news, that we are sinners separated from God because he's holy. And so he sends Jesus, God in flesh, to die in our place, live the sinless perfect life to satisfy the holiness of God. He had to be man to die in our place as a substitute. So he did and then rose from the dead to show that he was no mere moral man or prophet, like he was God. He conquered death, walked out of that grave. No other religion can say that because no other religion is by God. But we stopped there. We're like, okay, I'll trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins and so I'll go in heaven when I die and then I'm just gonna eke out this spiritual existence in this life. And so here you are saved, but you're not free. I've talked to so many people in our ministry, regeneration, thousand people meet in the same room Monday night, every Monday, 6.30. They're saved, they've trusted in Jesus, but they are not free according to what Jesus has given them. Saved, but not free. And you read the scripture and you're like, that, must, that can't be. He saved us and he keeps us safe. Like, we're just like too simply satisfied. Like, all right, well, I guess, man, my thing's my thing. Like, I, I mean, I, I was exposed to porn when I was eight and I've, I've tried to quit. I, I've pled with God to take it away through tears, but man, I go back to it and here I am, 20 something, 30 something, still addicted to porn. It's gotten worse, man. Started a swimsuit edition or whatever, lingerie, and now it's like full blown, twisted, messed up. Or maybe same sex attraction. And you've never told anybody. Never told anybody. Jesus wants you to be free. Maybe, maybe you're sexually abused as a kid. For, for men, it's one in five, for girls, it's one in three like tons of people in this room, and that was not your fault. But Satan wants to keep that secret to torment you, torture you, and keep you isolated. Today can be the day to be free. Disordered eating, body image, the number of times you may have changed clothes to come here because you felt like you just didn't look right before you set foot in this place. Or, or you, 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 you overeat or you undereat like all those things, the drinking, the drugs, the weed, the pills, the junk you can get at the gas station that'll kill you. Like we're just struggling, the control and worry and anxiety that is crippling us as a society. Look, Jesus saves you from your sins eternally and he will save you from your sins today. I'm living proof of it. It's what he did for me. What he did for me, he'll do for you. 
I got home one night to my wife from work and uh, I walk in and there's a post-it note of like things to do. It was like, I don't know what it was. Like, hey, the sink's clogged, um, diaper pail needs to be taken out and kill the mosquitoes. <laughs> it's like, what? Hey, what do you want me to do? You want me to boil the ocean, cure cancer, or kill the mosquitoes? Which one do you want me to do first? Which one of those impossible things? What are you talking about? Kill the mosquitoes. She's like, yeah, I thought you might ask. Do you, you want a number for a place? I was like, oh, yeah, okay, give me the number for the place. I call him, I'm like, hey, my, uh, my wife says y'all can kill mosquitoes. Like, it looks like my kids are bona fide blood donors in our backyard. Is this legit? And they're like, yeah, man, we'll, we'll, we'll come out. We'll spray, we're gonna drop some stuff, we're gonna put up some traps and you know, we'll kill the mosquitoes. I'm like, okay, cool. Hey, um, you probably know this because you're a mosquito guy, but they fly, um, so they're gonna come over from my neighbor's yard. So what do we do then? Like, you're gonna kill them in my yard, but they're still gonna come in. It's like, yep, thought you might ask that. We'll come back out for free. You just call us the second you see a mosquito and we'll come back out, we'll kill every mosquito you see. It's like, no joke. It's exactly what God has promised you. It's exactly what God has promised you in Romans 8, 13. We, we, do you know, do you know how stupid it would look of me? It would, if Laura's like, hey, kill the mosquitoes. I'm like, okay, all right, I got this. Mm. One, two, okay, three, like stupidity. And it's what we do with our sin. We're like, okay, Jesus, you saved me. Now I got this. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrestle my way. I'm gonna try so hard to not sleep with my boyfriend again, though I know I shouldn't. We're both professing believers or everything but, like, man, we've gotta repent, but ah, oh, or, or whatever it is that you keep going back to and you just try and try and try. Look, your willpower has no power over sin's power, but God's power kills sin's power every time. Every time. It's Romans 8, 13. He says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. I'm proof of it. So are some of you. But God would never leave you there. If you live according to the flesh, you do what you want to do. Your flesh, you're going to die. Sin leads to death. It does. Sometimes has a long fuse, but it will. But if you put to death, think about the mosquitoes, you put to death the deeds of the flesh by the spirit, you will live. If you put to death the deeds of the flesh by the spirit, that by the spirit really matters. He's the sin killer. It's like the mosquitoes, man. Jesus saved you from sin. Now the Holy Spirit is going to kill the sin in your life. He's the sin killer. Cause you're like, man, I got some distance from it, but what if it pops back up again? Then you call on God again. He's gonna come back out and kill the sin every single time. It's what he lives to do. You can't, he can, it's his job. Just need to ask. You remember the penny that you got when you walked in? I'm gonna go back on my journey here. The penny is like the smallest increment in money. As I said, like you see one in a parking lot, you won't even pick it up. You just walk by like, that's borderline worthless. Well, that's how I felt when I was first getting sober. I'm like, one day? You kidding me? I need a lifetime of sobriety. What's, what good is one day? I need serious help. But it says in the scriptures, do not despise the day of small beginnings for the Lord delights to see the work begin. Like don't despise those small beginnings because God's at work. But these pennies, these, these teeny tiny next to worthless pennies. I guarantee you, if we pulled up Elon Musk's bank account, you know what it would go down to? The very last cent. All of his wealth is just a massive accumulation of cents, singular cents. And so it is, and so it has been in my life. Because that first week, when I was first getting sober, it was like, all right, here's one day. I commit to being sober by God's strength, but I mean, what good is, what, are you kidding me? One day, it's worthless. Two days, 48 hours, I mean, that's, that's no good. And then I went a week. And I was like, I can go a week. I mean, a week, I can go a week on my own strength. That's nothing. And then I went a month. And it wasn't hard. I was still tempted, but God was doing it. And then it kept going every day on my knees, God, keep me sober today. But then there was this day, I was in Hungary, in Budapest, Hungary. 
sitting at a bar, which you shouldn't if you're a recovering alcoholic, but I was, because I didn't have anywhere else to go. I, I was still learning, like, what do I do as a sober person? So I'm sitting in a bar, drinking a coffee, still smoking cigarettes, hadn't given that up yet, and everybody's having pints. And I'm like, God, you gotta keep me sober. This was a hard one that day in Budapest, Hungary, but he kept me sober. And then there was this one. I was on my honeymoon in Mexico. I was at an all-inclusive resort. So technically I had bought a ton of alcohol. I just couldn't drink it. It's really unfortunate, <laughs> but it was fortunate. And Laura's like, hey, I'm gonna go get ready for dinner. So just meet me back there. And there I am sitting around tables of drinks that people had left. And back in the day, I had no qualms drinking every single one of them, like, dude, free booze. And I'm just looking at them. God, keep me sober. Keep me sober by your strength. I can't, you can. I can't, you can. And then there was this one. I was in Colorado with my wife, her family. Everybody left the room and there was a glass of wine sitting on the table. I picked up the glass of wine and went, God, keep me sober, please keep me sober. I can't, you can't, keep me sober. But over the course of time, he was keeping me sober. One day at a time, one singular day, one year became five years, became 10 years, and then 17 years sober. But truth be told, it wasn't 17 years. It was 6,347 singular days walking with my God and him setting me free. And so I don't know what your thing is. Everybody's got something. Everybody in this room's got something. It says in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so I want you to think about what your thing is right now. Like what's your thing that you keep going back to that you wanna be freed from? Because I want you to, uh, I wanna tell you how I got free. Really simple, here it is, very, very simple. I've told you the journey, now here it is for you because we all got something. If you're struggling with sin, you need to act, A-C-T. You're gonna see it on the screen. The first one is ask. You've got to ask God for help. You can't do this on your own. That's what scripture says, you, but the spirit can. So you bring him into the fight, you ask. Then C is commit, commit to 24 hours. Don't commit for the rest of your life. How many of us have been like, I'm never gonna do it again, God. And the next week, there we are. And he says, don't worry about tomorrow, just today. Seek me in my righteousness. So you commit for 24 hours with a brother or sister in Christ. And, and, and don't go all mixed gender on this. Don't, don't start doing this with a girl that you like. Girls with girls, guys with guys. Find a brother in Christ you trust, sister in Christ you trust, and commit. Say, hey, I commit to you by God's strength, not mine, for the next 24 hours. I'm not gonna give in to X, Y, or Z and say what it is. You know, don't say lust, say, say porn. Don't say sexual impurity, say sleeping with my boyfriend. Don't say my eating struggle. Tell, you tell them exactly what it is. You wanna know why? Because in James 5.16, it says, confess your sins to one another. That's back and forth, that's not one way. And then it says, and pray for each other, not so that you would be shamed or condemned or accused. It says, when we confess and pray so that you may be healed. That when we confess and someone else prays, God heals. And so I've said before, I'll say it again, if you wanna be forgiven, confess to God. If you wanna be free, he has ordained that we confess to each other and pray for each other and then he heals. Why? Because he knows that everybody's struggling. He's like, I want this to break out. That everybody would confess whatever it is they're dealing with, pray for each other and I'm gonna heal them. And there's gonna be this unending ripple effect through Christendom as my people are getting free. So that's commit for 24 hours. And then you take out your phone, just like I did. You, you, you set an alarm for whatever time you're gonna do this. Maybe you struggle most at night, maybe it's in the morning, maybe it's in the middle of the day, but you set an alarm and you follow up with that person every day and they with you. 
You just ask him, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to get free from this. Is there anything you're struggling with? Let's do this, 24 hours. Let's check in with each other at five o'clock daily. Let's get on our knees or a position of humility, like pray, ask God to help, commit for 24 hours, and then text the next day and follow up. Because what'll happen is when you get tempted, as you will, like I did, like all my buddies, like, hey, let's go out. I was tempted. But I was like, no, I gotta follow up with that Charlie guy. And, and my resolve was strengthened. And yours will be too. As you remember, like, no, nah, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna follow up with my buddy, my sister in Christ. Maybe you reach out to him, like, hey, I'm really struggling right now, please pray. And God's gonna set you free, just like he did me. I, I couldn't conceive of a life without alcohol, and now I got 17 plus years. Take a look at your penny. This is crazy, it's crazy. What does it say at the top of the penny? And God, we trust. We don't trust in ourselves to get free from sin. You can't. We trust in God for that singular day, smallest increment. Trust in you, not in me. Trust in me got me nowhere. You see the word, this is unique to the penny. It's not another, it's not another coins. The word right there over Lincoln's shoulder, liberty. It says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom Christ has set you free. And he's writing to a bunch of people who are like, yeah, Jesus, we trust you for salvation. And now we're going to try to follow all these rules. And he's like, you can't. You can't. God can. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. And then the last thing, who's on the coin? Lincoln. What was Lincoln most known for? setting free the slaves, who never should have been slaves, but they were, set them free. The Emancipation Proclamation. Jesus Christ, it says in the scriptures, has set the slaves free. It says in the word that we were slaves to sin and Satan prior to placing our faith in Jesus Christ. He's our Lincoln. He's the one that came. Lincoln laid down his life, shot by John Wilkes Booth in Ford Theater because he was freeing the slaves and had done so. Jesus laying down his life for his life that ours would go free, to free the slaves, to sin and Satan, why he came, rose again. And the Emancipation Proclamation is Romans chapter six, where he says that you have been crucified with Christ, laid down and raised again to walk in newness of life. I was reading Romans 6 once, thinking about all this, thinking about my journey, like what God's done. And I was reading the whole chapter. It was on a Tuesday night, actually. My wife used to work on the porch staff. So I'm sitting up there waiting for her, and I'm thinking about all this. Like, man, I used to be such a drunk. Jesus, you saved me. You set me free. And he he gave me these words. You say that I'm a slave, Satan? Yeah, you used to own me, tease, puppet, and control me. You promised to spoil me rotten, but seems like rotten's all I've gotten. Far worse by your curse, not a limo, but a hearse. You had it running through my veins, always numbing all my pains, but it never would sustain. But I tried and imbibed and relied on a feeling like a junkie needing more, getting high, and then reeling. Your lies were crafty and always sounded brand new, even though time and time again, I swore I was through. It was like daily amnesia and sweet poison was your feature. Like a caged abused beast, always promising the feast, you kept me hungry and longing for more, but you never loved me. I was only your whore. And so you fed me and misled me just enough to keep me loyal, making me think that somehow, someday, through all my inner toil, I could be freed from this disaster, you cruel, addicting master. Like a mistreated woman who knew no other life, I went back to the jerk despite all of the strife. (laughs) But while you were sleeping, Satan, Another came knocking and grabbed me by my life with all his crazy talking. He said that as a slave, there's only one way out and that his way, the only way was not a safe or easy route. His solution was to die. My heart pounding through my chest. I thought he came to rescue, but his answer was straight death. Then this man, like a father, smiled as he said, you'll no longer be a slave when your master finds you dead. 
Then he took me in his arms and laid me down into the deep, spiritually suffocating. I tried to wrestle, but he would keep holding me under until I gave in. It was necessary for this slave to sin, to give up my last breath until he verified my death. It was finished because I was born again. His holy breath filled my chest, alive and knew the curse had left. My old master had no power. It was no longer his hour. He still tried calling, but now I didn't listen because I was new and I had a new mission. It was all about my king. I was rescued and redeemed, and it couldn't happen on my own or by following some rules. It demanded a savior, not the council of fools. It required his death and mine as well but it didn't stop there. Now I live to tell that he rose again and thus so did I. He made me new, never again will I die. My old master won't quit and still tempts me with thrill, but now I hate him because I know his intent is to kill. So I won't go back to the patterns of old. I am a new slave, redeemed, I'm sold. I have a new master, one Christ, one Lord. Now to him I cry out when hungry, tired, or bored. You say that I'm a slave, Satan? Indeed, his solely, and this slave is now free, and the result will be holy. My new master is good, loving, and just. His life leads to peace, if only you'll trust. In his life and death and rising again, he took your place and nailed all your sin to the cross and disarmed the enemy. He is the way, truth, and life eternally from one slave to another. Won't you come and see? My Jesus breaks chains and sets the slaves free. In Romans chapter six, verse six, we know We know that our old self was crucified with him. Our old self, the one that was a slave to sin and Satan was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free, has been set free free, has been set free from sin through Jesus Christ, your risen Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have saved me and you have delivered me from my sin that devoured me. And I believe that what you did for me you will do for everyone in this room should they call upon you. The question is not if this is true. Lord, I long for them to know that it is true for you, it's true for them, and that they would begin this walk of daily repentance to not only trust you for their salvation, but to trust you every day for their freedom. Because it's for freedom that you have set us free. And so I pray before they walk out these doors tonight, they would text another person, nudge their neighbor and say, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's let repentance be the root of revival. Let it begin with me. Because Jesus is coming back. One year, two years, 10. Jesus is coming back. And may he find his bride without wrinkle, stain or blemish at his coming. God, we can't, but you can. And so we stand and we sing to you, our risen Savior, our deliverer from sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all please stand, sing to Jesus now.